Welcome to the show, James Swanick here. My guest today is Dr. Samantha Hart, a licensed clinician, doctor of physical therapy, a mum of two. She is the author of the book, Breaking the Circuit, How to Rewire Your Mind for Hope, Resilience and Joy in the Face of Trauma. And she is the host of the Truth About Addiction podcast. Mm. Dr. Hart has 20 years in the fitness industry and 15 years being alcohol free. And today we're going to be talking about a possible fresh perspective on what I think we both agree is the outdated 12 step program, why addiction is not a choice nor a problem, how Dr. Hart dealt with her mother's mm -hmm. mental illness and effective ways to rewire your mind. So mm -hmm. it's a big welcome to Dr. Samantha Hart. Welcome. Thank you so much, James. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Truly, I think my most favorite things every 24 hours are anything joyful and anything truthful. <laughs> so when I get on a podcast and I know I'm going to be talking about things that matter, it's a great day. What's interesting is that anything truthful, most people, people in the world, I would submit is anything but joyful. In fact, mm. people facing their truths can bring up a lot of stress and anxiety and shame and mm. guilt, can't it? Yes. And I, what I want to say to that is in recovery, I remember early on, there was this phrase about having to match the level of calamity you're in with equal amounts of serenity. And as I trudged in my sobriety and went through harder and harder things, one of which was my husband's extramarital affair, I remember when my intuition was nudging me to stay and fight once I found out, make it work, that I would only have a fighting chance if I matched the level of betrayal I felt with equal amounts of forgiveness. And then in more recent years, as I've navigated quite a few really, really hard, heavy losses of people I love, I have had to rewrite that part of the book, if you will, so that I could match my level of grief, regret, guilt, or shame with equal amounts of joy. And I think the reason those two things are so important to me every day <laughs> is precisely that, because the truth is a really tough pill to swallow. And so I seek out joy like the air that I breathe. And ironically, the air that we breathe is joy. If we have the right mindset, I would submit. Mm. Yes, it's definitely about a perspective shift again and again. <laughs> yes, yes. We talk a lot in our uh, organization, Alcohol Free Lifestyle, about supporting our clients, rewiring their mindset. Mm. And I think a lot of what we're about to talk about is shifting our perspective, rewiring mm. our mindset. Mm. and recognizing that there isn't necessarily any good or bad that's happening. There's just a bunch of stuff happening, mm -hmm. and it's our perspective and our mindset that shapes how we process what is happening. Has that been your experience as you've gone through life? <laughs> oh, goodness, yes, and that reminds me that someone – recently said trauma isn't what happened to us. It's how we perceive what happened to us. Yes. So, oh God, yes. When I think now, after 15 years in recovery, about some of the biggest pain body wounds, you know, the places from which I sought out things outside of myself to make me feel better. Really, the two biggest ones are self-abandonment 
because it kept me safe in my house, not to honor my intuition and to please others and to fix and to save. That's where I derived all of my worthiness and perfectionism, anything that could be highly controlled that was from outside of me so that I could feel safe on the inside. And so once you take away the drug or the alcohol or the substance that's anesthetizing those wounds, you're either going to live out in those patterns into perpetuity. And you might have a ton of success, by the way. <laughs> if you're a type A, which uh, so many of your lis listeners probably are being uh, serial entrepreneurs, hungry for the best possible outcome, that can be, you know, in recovery, they call it character defects. And I think that word is just inherently so flawed. Uh, it's a character trait to be type A, to be highly ambitious, to be a perfectionist. And it can either be an asset or a liability. And as I gathered time living an alcohol-free, a substance-free lifestyle, I learned right away when I couldn't anesthetize it, when it crossed that invisible line away from being an asset and into being a liability. Because what I presented like was the most culturally productive and spiritually bankrupt human on earth. What do I mean by that? I had a doctorate, real fancy. I had a private practice. I ran my own business. And even in the first year of running my own business, I wasn't in the red. I was making a profit margin. Very few people can say that. I had a husband. I was renting on the west side near the ocean in Santa Monica, California. I mean, good Lord, check, check, check the boxes. And on the inside, I might as well have been dead. So without a radical perspective shift and thousands of micro habits pointing the needle of my life in a new direction so that no matter what was happening on the outside, I would be okay on the inside, I would have been dead. Dead one way or, or another, spiritually for sure, but probably physically too. I'd like to ask you a little bit more about your story, maybe introduce yourself. And then I just want to preview what we, we might talk about after we've gotten to know you a little bit more, because I've noticed that your verbiage so far has mentioned recovery, sobriety, mm. and mm. certainly our philosophy at Alcohol Free Lifestyle is to avoid those terminologies. And I'll mm. explain why later on. Uh, and I'd love to have a conversation with you about that as to what you think recovery means and why you feel mm -hmm. like that's a, a worthy word to be using, mm -hmm. uh, given that you're 15 years now alcohol free and alcohol free again, is the terminology that we use, uh, instead of, instead of sober. But before we get to that, mm -hmm. uh, please tell us a little bit more about, about you. I know you kind of referenced, there was a mar uh, extramarital affair and you were broken, mm -hmm. you were living in Santa Monica. And you're 15 years alcohol free, which suggests that you were numbing yourself with alcohol at some point. So just tell us a little bit more of your story, if you would, Dr. Hart. Sure. I was from the gate as a young girl, hyper exposed to drugs, sex, infidelity. Everything was very, very normalized. So my mom was a prescription pill abuser. My parents were miserable, but married for the kids, <laughs> wanted to stay together for us. <laughs> and my father played the role of family enabler. So if the doctor said to my mom, I cannot keep refilling this prescription, my father would get it in his name and then give it to her. And then as my sister and I got older, he would just give us things like Xanax and Ambien. And so between that, my mother cheating on my father, telling me all about it while my dad was living downstairs. And my father was very emotionally absent and lived quite of his life in denial. So whatever my mother said was the equivalent of God in my house. That was the truth. 
and what was right at all costs. And then my sister was awkwardly adolescent, frizzy hair, big nose, gaining weight, experimenting with drugs, experimenting with sex with both men and women, sneaking out and going to the most dangerous and alluring New York City nightclubs. And so by the time I'm getting out of the house and going away to college, I am sure of two things. Whatever I use, men, relationships, sex, alcohol, I will absolutely have control over it no matter what and game on because there's no weird or wrong thing about experimenting. And two, that only things outside of myself are going to make me okay in the world, like how pretty I was, how thin I was, how smart I was, the degree that I got, the person that I dated, which is a real recipe for disaster. And without going into why I left Boston University, because I was there for two years, and took a year off, because that story's in my book and it, it could take up half this podcast interview. I took a year off. And what I really always wanted to do, because I was just majoring in communications, it felt like it casted a nice wide net for a young girl who really had no idea what she wanted to get her degree in. She only knew that she wanted to dance and sing like a fool. I wanted a record deal. I wanted to be a big time choreographer. I wanted to be in the entertainment industry. And my mom thought that was a really dangerous, unstable idea because if you get your degree, nobody can take it from you. And she had had a really unstable life in all realms, financially included. So I listened and I got my degree. But when I had that year off, I thought, mm, this is my chance. I'm going to hit the ground running. I'm going to go be a star. I'm going to audition. And in order to pay my rent in Manhattan, which is where I ended up moving to, because I'm from Brooklyn, New York. So Manhattan was like a second home to me. I bartended. And as I bartended, I picked up all kinds of jobs and dabbled in the auditioning world, was dancing. I was teaching dance. I was a personal trainer, just kind of experimenting with what I might do for work while hustling and making enough money to pay my rent. And as my drinking picked up behind the bar, cocaine became sort of a natural introduction that I tried because I obviously thought, no big deal. Of course, I can control my cocaine intake. It really didn't do anything for me. And I think that sparked my curiosity. So I kept doing it. And then in no time, I realized if I had drank too much behind the bar, I could just do some cocaine and it would level me back out, lather, rinse, repeat. And in hindsight, you know, this was the period of my life where my active addiction took off. And I really do think there's some correlation that I didn't put together for many, many years, honestly, until I was really writing my book and having to dive back into these parts of my life. But what happened at that university and why I left elicited such intense shame inside of me, coupled with the fact that once I got to Manhattan, it was like, I mean, that city will chew you up and spit you out if you're not careful. So the freedom and the entitlement and the arrogance and the thinking that I would be fine no matter what I did, it was like, bring it on, highly self-indulgent. So it was a really wild combination of everything I had learned in my house what had happened at the university and the shame I felt and what I wanted to do to cover that up. And this feeling of the world is my oyster. And so I had had way too much cocaine one night. And this was after dabbling in personal training and going, mm, no, I'm not going to make a career out of this, but maybe physical therapy. That's really prestigious. I could put doctor in front of my name. So I was kind of splitting myself between trying to be a star and trying to be a fancy academic. And uh, I did a little too much cocaine one night with a girl that partied as hard as I did. And it happened to be on the night that I found out I got into a doctoral program. So the way that I celebrated was to buy an eight ball, obviously. And by the end of the evening, I felt so fuzzy. 
I went into my bedroom. This woman was in there uh, wrapping presents. It was Christmas time in Manhattan. We had shopped all over, high as a kite, came back to the apartment. She was in her cocaine zone doing what she was doing. And I ended up on my side coming to with her hovering over me on the phone with 911 because I had overdosed. And she said I was seizuring and swatting her off of me. She was trying to turn me on my side, which eventually she succeeded at doing, to pull my tongue out of my throat so I wouldn't choke and die. When I realized something awful had just happened, I immediately knew that no one could ever find out about this. And the next day was Christmas Eve, and I'll be damned if I'm going to bring this Sam goes to the hospital the night before Christmas Eve. She's found out all of the external accolades collapse. No, get off the phone. Nobody's going to know about this. I'm fine. And so for the next year and a half, I found a way to do what we do. I just switched what I was putting into my body. So it wouldn't be as severe. So I wouldn't potentially overdose. And the thing was by now I had had this boyfriend who I loved very much, who loved me. But when he decided he was done partying and I had only just begun, that was the beginning of the fracture between us. So at that point I had been lying, using, cheating behind his back. He was just staying like a good codependent sometimes does when they don't know how to leave. The only person I knew to call after that overdose was this guy I used to train at the gym. His name was Bobby. We would box. He was this really cool guy from Hell's Kitchen and he had 22 years sober from heroin. So when I overdosed, I got real spooked, called Bobby. I said, I, I'm in trouble. He took me to a meeting and I said, nope. No fucking way. Get me out of here. <laughs> These are not my people. This is not my issue. I'm good. And then I did what, what, what I did. And I spent the next year and a half trying to just cut and paste, got, got my dad to come into the city regularly to give me Xanax and Ambien, smoked a lot of weed and figured if I just did a bunch of downers instead of uppers, my chances of a horrific overdose or death might lessen. And then the guy I was living with found that prescription pill bottle that my dad had been supplying me with for, you know, decades at that point. I had moved my hiding spot from this random canister in our bathroom to our shared sock drawer. Call that what you will. <laughs> Some people call it a God shot in, in program. Some people call it divine intervention. Maybe it was just a sloppy decision by an addict. I don't know. But either way, he found it. He looked at me with absolute disgust in his eyes, which basically just reflected the shame that I felt about myself at the time. And I called Bobby again. And I said, I don't know what else to do, but you seem to have figured something out that I haven't. Took me to another meeting, sat in the back, said, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I don't look like you. I don't drink like you. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be a doctor for God's sakes. I got a boyfriend. I got a, I got a this, I got a that. Like, you know, the way that higher functioning, really successful people can stay sick in whatever, whatever it is they're struggling with for a long, long time. It's, it's very, very confusing when you are so culturally productive, but you have this little problem over here that you just want to tie up in a bow and, and get rid of. And I didn't believe a single thing on the walls. I couldn't stand the language of the steps. I was taught in my house. There is no such thing as God. God is for fools. God is for the weak. And the only person you can count on is yourself. Not to mention, remember in my house, it was matriarchal and the steps are patriarchal, <laughs> you know, and they're highly, highly outdated period. And as a, as an intellectual person, they just offended me. And in hindsight, you know, this idea that I was just in my ego fighting the program tooth and nail is really missing the mark because 
those steps as they were laid out were, were actually butting up against deep childhood beliefs that had kept me safe. So what was actually happening to me was that my nervous system felt threatened by them. I went into fight or flight and I wanted out because they felt unsafe. So now I was stuck between, well, drinking and drugging is unsafe because it's, it's, it almost killed me. And now it's going to threaten my relationship and God forbid he leaves me. Then I'm nothing. <laughs> then I'm no one. That's how little I thought of myself. And at the same time, working those steps also felt life-threatening. So, so now what? So I just sort of followed Bobby around Manhattan. He sponsored me for that next year. He knew I hated God. I didn't believe in it. He said, it's all right. He didn't care. He just, he loved me. He just wanted to, he just wanted to help me. And I didn't believe a single thing or a single person, but I believed that he had figured something out that I hadn't. And at the end of that year, he started to act different. Couldn't quite put my finger on it. And, um, we were friends, you know, before he was my sponsor, cause he was a client of mine. And I just had this feeling that I wanted to go back to that. I had a chance to come out to California, the boyfriend who I cheated on a lot. We were still together. He really wanted to move to California. I had a chance to go to Cedar Sinai as part of my graduate program. And I said to Bobby, look, let's go back to being friends and, uh, I'll find a temporary sponsor. I don't know what's going on with you, but that's more important to me that we preserve our friendship. And I came out to California and it was just so exciting to be here. I was almost done with graduate school and I started to go to the dance studios again. I was in LA. All the things I wanted when I was in my addiction were starting to happen. People were noticing me in class. I was getting opportunities to teach. And I thought, oh my God, maybe California will be a place where one foot can be in the entertainment industry and one foot could be in the PT world, or maybe I can combine them both. The whole world was open to me and I wanted to tell Bobby about it. And every time I called, he didn't pick up. And I got so pissed because I thought it was his ego getting in the way of picking up the phone because I sort of fired him from being my sponsor. Turns out his wife picked up eventually and said, Bobby relapsed. That's why you haven't heard from him. Maybe you can see him when you get back to New York. That knocked me on my ass because he was the only thing that worked for me. He was the only person I believed and I could not wait to get back to New York. And when I did, and I met up with him, it was so frightening because I think we all have this experience when you're in the presence of somebody who's got a really big, beautiful, bright spirit, you can see it, you can feel it. And on the opposite side of that, when you are in the presence of what I call a ghost, which is a person like my mom or like an addict who's active and using, whose body is alive, but whose spirit, the thing that makes them quintessentially who they are, is dead. Is so scary. And that's what it was like to be with Bobby. It was like someone went behind his eyes and blew the light out. It was so frightening for me. And I kept trying to make sense of it. I kept trying to ask him the right question to get the right answer. And it was just a bunch of excuses and an avoidance of looking me in the eye. And I met up with him one other time after that and then knew that I needed some space from that relationship because I was so confused about it. And uh, a sober friend of mine a few weeks later said, where are you right now? And I said, why? And she said, I'm going to, uh, I need to come see you. 
So just stay where you are. She came to my apartment, sat down, put her hand on my forearm and said, Bobby's dead. He jumped out of his eighth story window. So the man who saved my life ended up ending his own. And in that moment, I knew if I relapsed, if I touched alcohol or drugs, I was dead. I was totally dead because if it killed Bobby with 22 years, it's coming for me. And at the same time, to work those steps was to kill off everything about me that I had learned to survive in the world. So now what? (laughs) And when I say that the next five years of my life, I was just running on my perfectionism, on my inner controller who was sitting in the seat of CEO of my life. And it really worked. See, perfectionism works brilliantly, except it collapses with matters of the heart. And in those early years, that man that I cheated on, who found the pills, who I moved to California with eventually, he became my fiance and then he became my husband. And then he started pulling away emotionally, physically, financially. And as he did, I unraveled. I did not have any skills not only from the way I was raised, but I hadn't gathered any new healthy skills in recovery, really. I'd only learned to abstain. I hadn't shifted my mindset. I hadn't really changed my perspective. I still firmly believed that I was only okay if everything outside of me was okay. And this guy was proof that I was okay. But now he was pulling away from me. So the more he pulled away, the more I literally, spiritually, unraveled. And when I say that the fighting between us was severe, not physically, always verbally, just shouting, 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 screaming and crying, it was constant, it was daily, and it went on for a year and a half. He would leave on trips, he would leave his ring, he'd come back and I'd say, I know you're fucking cheating on me, just tell me the truth. I don't know what you're talking about. You're the, you're the cheater. You're the one who did this. Begging him for, to go to therapy, begging him to go to a 12 step program, something because he was angry and he had a right to be angry, but God damn it. You married me anyway. So I was just, it was all about him, what he needed to do so he could finally forgive me and we could finally be happy. And at some point we had this one fight and I kicked my foot through the wall of this house we were renting and the paint chips fell on the floor and I was filled with rage and rage really was not a, a part of my story in my life. So it was a new and very frightening feeling sober And I I knew in that moment that I had to get out of the house. Now, if someone had told me what that was about to turn into, I I probably never would have left. I don't know what would have happened to me. I might have relapsed. But what started as sleeping on a friend's couch for a couple nights turned into months and months of couch surfing because I didn't want to leave the marriage but I couldn't function inside of it the way that it looked. And eventually a sober friend after begging my husband, have we had enough time apart yet? Please, do you forgive me yet? Please on the, on the streets of New York city while I was going home to see family begging him. And he said, I don't know what to tell you. We're not, you know, we're not in a place where it makes sense to move back in. Call my sober friend flipping out screaming, 
about this man and how he won't love me. (laughs) She said, you need to find a place that is your own. If you do not sign a lease, you're, you're going to die. You need to take care of yourself. If you're not ready to leave your marriage, you cannot live like this. The idea of signing a lease was such a, such a frightening thing because it was real evidence that the house of cards was collapsing, that this last bit of stuff that I was sure I could control, I couldn't. (laughs) And yet I didn't want to die. I just didn't know how to live. So I knew I had to do something. I signed a lease and I had had a lot of different sponsors between Bobby and this moment, most of whom did not work for me at all. Pressed God down my throat when I hated the idea of it, who did, who could not meet me spiritually where I was at, at all. And then this woman walked into my life and, um, and she said, what if we do the steps on your marriage? I was like, what do you mean? Well, she said, you're not about to go out and call the cocaine dealer. I mean, maybe if you, if you stay in this place long enough, maybe you will. But right now, every, every ounce of your focus is on this. And so that's what we did. We made a start with the steps in a brand new way. I am powerless over my marriage. I am powerless over the fighting, whether we're going to work it out over whether he's cheating on me or not over whether he'll ever forgive me for what I did over the death of all my hopes and dreams, everything I thought this was going to look like, and it doesn't. And when I try to exert power over any of those things that I can't, my life becomes unmanageable in the following ways. I have no peace. I have no access to real power. The kind that comes from inside of me. I have no sense of worthiness or self-worth. And so suddenly the steps made a lot of sense to me. Like, wow, if I could, if I could use them like this, I can get behind that. And one of the most pivotal parts of my story where I really feel like I started having a way to live again, and I mean live outside of the grips of perfectionism, was when we did the ninth step, which is uh, making amends. And all I had ever done in recovery is is make amends to other people. (laughs) You know, addicts hurt a lot of people uh, by the time they get clean. And so fair, fair that I owed people an apology. But I have never once met a person who is anesthetizing their pain, no matter what it is, with food, Instagram, sex, friendship, alcohol, who isn't carrying around shame inside of them, which I believe is the most corrosive thing we carry. And she said, have you ever made an amends to yourself? Well, well, no, (laughs) no. As a perfectionist, I, I was run by my inner critic. So it, it was unfathomable to me to let myself off the hook for anything I had done. It almost felt like if I did, I wouldn't be able to produce anything. Not good enough, Sam. That's an A minus. Try harder next time. So who was I without that? And as soon as I got into a practice, because boy, is that a practice. You don't just look in the mirror and say, I love you. And you're poof, you're healed (laughs) from years of self-laceration. No, but I was making a start at interrupting the negative self-talk of soothing myself in a way that didn't require me to go to someone else. And That process allowed me to clear away enough of the shame I was carrying around in my marriage to see it for what it was instead of what it used to be before I fucked it up 
or what I dreamed it could be when he finally forgave me. I could actually see that it sucked, (laughs) that it was not working for me at all, and that it's not actually what I wanted or deserved. So this version of the steps is really what became my life raft. It brought me back to the land of the living, a place where no matter what was happening on the outside of me, I was starting to trust that I was going to be okay. Because what happened when I cleared away the shame is I started to finally hear the whisper of my intuition. For example, in those early days in that apartment, what had always soothed me to sleep besides the obvious, like alcohol or the pills my dad was providing (laughs) was something outside of myself, like my mom stroking my hair when I was a little girl or my husband taking over that role. I'd plop my head in his lap and he would stroke my hair and I'd go to sleep. And all of a sudden in that apartment, who was going to do that? I was by myself. I was literally living alone for the first time as a 30 year old woman. And my intuition said, you're going to have to put your arms around yourself. And I remember hearing that voice and thinking, huh? (laughs) Because it sounded so different than my controller. She was loud and demanding and she kind of gave me anxiety every time she spoke up. (laughs) She got me very obsessive. I had to figure it out right now. And this other voice was calm and quiet and curious, just making a loving suggestion about what I might do. And I did that. In those early days in that apartment, I wrapped my arms around myself and sometimes was sobbing. And that's how I would fall asleep. That relationship, this is 10 years later now, as I sit here talking to you, is what I call God. Slowly over the last 10 years, I've totally dismantled the belief system I had around God, which was my mother's, you know, she, she taught me about the religious type of God that she hated. And I got to dismantle that and formulate the word God or spirit or essence or higher power or divine guidance or whatever you want to call it. And all of a sudden, it didn't matter what she thought or what Catholicism thought or what culture thought. It didn't matter. I had found this internal guidance system inside of me that when I honored it, made my life better. And I started to have some wins when I took her suggestions. She suggested I start a business because I could see as a physical therapist, not only was I making way less money than the debt I had (laughs) accumulated by going to graduate school, but she was paying attention. She was seeing that all these patients were getting discharged way before they were better. Remember I was a dancer. And I thought, well, I want to be able to dance till I'm in the ground. I want to be the 95 year old grandma embarrassing my grandkids at their wedding. So where are all these patients going who are 60% better, but who want to run and hike and go on bold, adventurous trips and use their body in full three dimensions? Who's training those people? Oh, the personal trainers, the Pilates instructors, the yoga teachers, and they're all getting cash and they're getting three times as much money as the doctor of physical therapy. Well, that seems silly. 
And so I started a business based on the extension of care. That apartment I lived in, when my lease went up, moved back in with my husband. Things were better, seemingly. And I kept that apartment and I turned it into my first business space. (laughs) And then three weeks into living with my husband again, he was acting insane, still rejecting me physically, emotionally, avoiding eye contact. But I was different. And I looked at him and said, I don't want to do this with you. I don't know what is going on with you, but I'm done. And I don't deserve this. He begged me to stay. And three weeks later, I found out from the woman he had been cheating on me with that he was in this five-year extramarital affair on and off that began before I got sober and seeped into our marriage and became this crazy blackmailing, if you don't do this or come here, I'm going to tell Samantha everything. I know where you guys live in LA. Her stuff's all over the internet. And he was just ill, 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 sick with resentment and lies and shame and secrecy, straddling himself between both these worlds, trying so hard for me to never find out and cover it up and keep this other girl quiet. And eventually all of that collapsed because I wanted to leave anyway. All his lying and covering up and hoping I never found out, it didn't work because I was out. I had finally healed enough to say no. So she told me everything. She kept her promise. She said, you're going to leave me? Watch how I destroy your whole life. But the cool thing about that moment was that I knew I'd be okay. I knew I'd be okay. And I moved out again into an apartment. And I had the other one where I started my business. (laughs) So my whole life began when I reimagined the steps. It became a guidepost for how I got through my hardest things, including finding out that in fact I was right, that he was cheating on me, that my sweet little intuition that had been whispering He's cheating on you. He's cheating on you was right. And this business idea that my intuition suggested I try was a good one. I met clients during that year that I moved out, was sure I was going to get divorced, by the way. Didn't end up happening. (laughs) I took them back. But I met these clients who loved what I was trying to do in the healthcare industry. I was disrupting it. They said, we want to invest in you. We love what you're doing. I had this vision of a one-stop shop for health and wellness, a place where people could really go and get better, not just in their bodies, in their spirits, in their minds, a place where there might be psychology, acupuncture, nutrition. So they invested and I expanded. You know, in the beginning for me, there was no place to trust. There was no faith whatsoever. I only had the old coping mechanisms that I held onto for dear life until I was face down in a pit of despair. That's where the leap happened where you're in complete darkness, but you don't want to die. Bobby's death had made me frightened and sure that if I touched alcohol or drugs, I was going to die and I didn't want to die. So now I had to take a leap of faith into some strange new part of my life, not knowing where I was going, not hearing my intuition, not knowing anything about where I was headed That's the really scary part when you're on the precipice of change. Then when you start to have wins and you're moving in a new direction and you start to go, wait a second, when I don't keep living out of that old pattern, when I have a perspective shift and I take a leap and something good happens, 
Now you start to gather evidence. Oh my God, every time I trust my intuitive voice instead of my critical voice, this happens. Look what happened here and here and here and here. Turns out it's way bigger and way better than anything I could have ever imagined. But God damn it, in those early days, there were months and months and months where I was just putting one foot in front of the other. Really sad, really scared. And to be honest, if Bobby hadn't died in the dramatic way that he did, I don't know that I would have made it. I don't know that I would have kept putting one foot in front of the other long enough to have those wins. But his death frightened me. So I was able to exist in this gross paralysis where there was no real joy and I had no real tools for eight, nine months before I started to feel some hope again. And for the person listening, who's just face down, maybe you have all the outside things, you have a bustling, successful business, but you feel dead inside. You just got to hang on. You got to hang the fuck on because wow, it can get so good. My life today is unbelievable, unbelievable. And I credit so much of it to the reimagining of those steps and how I've used that again and again and again with everything that has happened in the last 10 years. And there's so much <laughs> that has happened. I can go on and on. So if you have a, a question well, about you. any of that, please. I, uh, I feel like many of the questions that I had were answered by you sharing mm. your story. So, mm. uh, uh, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. I think uh, what I'd like to do is because I promised our listener we'd have a conversation around the verbiage. Yes. We'll move to, we'll move to that. But just, uh, yeah, you sharing your story, I, I feel confident answered the questions I was going to ask about which mm. of the steps worked for you, which didn't, mm. why mm. addiction is not a choice or a problem, mm. uh, effective methods to rewire your mind. You talked about, you know, practical shifts and your intuition. Um, so I feel mm. like the, the questions I was going to ask were, were answered by your story. So let's just move what we have, what time we have left here to the verbiage and the power of the verbiage. Because uh, mm. you've mentioned recovery, you've mentioned sobriety, you've mentioned sober. So uh, maybe I'll just ask you to respond to how I see that terminology. Um, for me, the term recovery implies a return to a previous flawed state and it suggests mm. for me an ongoing struggle and a focus on past problems mm. in contrast what we use at alcohol free lifestyle is embracing the term alcohol free which i submit emphasizes a more positive present focused identity and a commitment to a healthier lifestyle so mm. by adopting alcohol free, which is the terminology we like to use. Individuals are empowered to define themselves by their current achievements and well being rather than their past challenges. Mm -hmm. And then as it relates to the term sobriety or sober, um, I feel that often carries connotations of deprivation, a constant battle against temptation, Mm -hmm. uh, reinforcing what I submit would be a negative association with the individual's past struggles. On the mm -hmm. other hand, alcohol free highlights, I submit a proactive choice and a sense of freedom, focusing on the positive aspects of living without alcohol. And so by identifying as alcohol free, as opposed to sober individuals can celebrate their decision to lead a healthier, more fulfilling life free from the constraints of their past dependency. So I would certainly welcome your views on that um, based on what I just submitted. Yeah, it's, it's so fascinating. So <clears throat> <laughs> 
what's what's really amazing is how any and all of these terms really wrap around me like a loose garment. You know, I could I could use any one of them and it all feels and means the same thing to me. That's how that's how much of an internal shift I have made. I could say I'm Samantha an addict, alcoholic, a recovering this, a sober that. It all means the same thing. Uh and doesn't have a bad connotation because that's how much work I've done in terms of mindset shift. When I say recovery, you know, and I you know, the title of my book has the word trauma in it. Recently somebody said to me because they're not living an alcohol free life, right? They're just a person on the planet, maybe struggling with whatever life. And she said, look, I'm not saying I'm a skeptic, but for someone like me who doesn't have some trauma, they can sort of look back on and think of like, why, why would I pick up your book? Why would I? And I said, all you have to do, it doesn't matter if you look back on your life, whether you had a hardcore drinking problem or you had big capital T trauma, abuse, neglect. Let's say you, you don't even know if you had trauma in your childhood. It seems like a pretty idyllic childhood. You know, parents loved you. You had a roof over your head, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? All you have to do is look at your current life, the quality of your relationships. (laughs) Are you happy at your job? Do you have stable, secure, deep, meaningful connections in your life? Or are you miserable, isolated, exhausted, (laughs) you know, having trouble sleeping, overweight? Just look at the quality of your life and it's going to shine a light on coping patterns, behaviors that you're stuck in for some reason or another that aren't really the best for you, the healthiest for you. And the reason I bring that up is because when I think of the word recovery, and I think now, what what do you mean by that? You're, I am, I am every 24 hours working on staying in proximity to my capital S self, my highest self, my, my, my truest, most beautiful, most authentic, most intuitive self. So I'm, I'm always looking to recover that part of myself because at any moment, bad night's sleep, hormones, mom, who's by the way, now living in a motel six because she's acutely mentally ill and got kicked out of the living facility. She's in and she's my only living family member left. She might send me a message that puts me into a tailspin where I want to go right back into controlling, fixing, managing, screaming, convincing. Okay. So recovering, always looking for, always seeking out what my highest self would have me know, would have me say, or would have me do. That's what recovery means to me. So even for the person who's, who's not identifying as anything really, just a, maybe a wildly successful entrepreneur who feels isolated, miserable, exhausted, alone, afraid, full of fear. I would argue that if they wanted to be in any kind of recovery, free of, of any kind of alcohol, the real freedom is, is becoming emotionally free. I feel the most emotional freedom when I am in living out of my highest self, living from that space, getting my knowledge and next right inspired action from that part of me. So I have no problem saying, you know, I'm in recovery. I'm, I'm every 24 hours, no matter what's going on, I'm always trying to recover and find in this complicated vessel that I'm living in where my inner controller is sitting at the boardroom table, my inner fighter, my inner perfectionist, my inner 
obsessed with the beauty and body standard. I have all these parts of me sitting at the table, ready to run the day, <laughs> depending on who shows up and what's going to happen and what kind of shit show lands on the table, right? But I want my highest self to be sitting in the seat of CEO. So I'm always looking, uh-oh, inner controllers just bumped her out. She's trying to be president again. Sorry, girlfriend. I know you're scared right now. I know everything feels out of control. And I know you just want to come in here and protect us like you had to do when you were young. But that's not going to be a surefire way to a happy life, to a sense of inner peace and freedom. You're not the one that gets us there. And we know this already. We've tried. <laughs> you have had your run as CEO, girlfriend, and we, you are being demoted just for today. <laughs> and I, my, my, the, uh, the, the intuitive part of me, she's going to go sit in that seat. So that when I think of recovery, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm always recovering that part of myself, you know, and there are days and weeks and moments where I don't have to try hard at all, or she's just doing her damn thing, you know? And so in that sense, am I in recovery of it? No, I'm just living from that space, but not always, not always. And, uh, and I think the same thing is true for sobriety. You know, I'm living a, a sober life, a mindful life, a life that, um, is free of, of trying to numb my pain, a life that, um, I can wake up clear headed. And when my head is really loud and angry and noisy and stressed, I can honor it, recognize it and go, okay, what do we need to do today to calm that down, to soothe, to have the intuitive voice be the loudest voice as the guidepost for our day. You know, what are we living a sober life is just living a clear headed life where I have the freedom to choose what I want to do with my day. So those words don't, don't mean anything, but beautiful things to me. They mean they, they, it's like the world is my oyster with them. And I've just rerouted my belief system around all of those words for so long that none of like the fact that I, I have a sweatshirt that says I've got God and a therapist too. And when I wear it, I laugh so hard thinking about all the other people who are so offended by the word God. Because they're either thinking like I used to, there is no such thing, or they're thinking about the Christian punishing God that maybe they grew up with. And I get it. I, I so deeply understand how difficult and painful that is, but I've overcome it. And when I wear that sweatshirt, what that means is that I'm walking around, I'm coming through all the doors to an important business meeting to a, a meeting with a friend that might be the end of the friendship or the start of a new version of it. I'm walking into all the hard, important things with all the therapy tools I've accumulated because boy, I've been in a lot of therapy, <laughs> all the reimagined 12 step tools and my intuition. We're walking in, we're sitting down and we're ready for whatever might come. That's all that it means. Dr. Samantha Hart is the author of the book, Breaking the Circuit, How to Rewire Your Mind for Hope, Resilience, and Joy in the Face of Trauma. And she is the host of the podcast, The Truth About Addiction Podcast. Dr. Hart, thank you so much for sharing your story and giving us your guidance in this conversation today. Thank you so much for having me. What a fun conversation. 